Okay, now we can move on on the uh, on our panel discussion. This is about doctors prescribing products of no approved therapeutic value. So I'd like to call the chair for this session, Dr. Silvia Benalia. Thank you, Jude. So after hearing Dr. Cabral, the objective of our next session is also the question I would like to ask everyone. Is it acceptable for physicians to prescribe products with no approved therapeutic value? Okay, so we have three panelists who will be answering and give their views regarding this question. And of course, uh, I would like to add, Doctora, with your permission, another sentence because I have to introduce you. For our young and aspiring doctors, Doctora Cabral is not just our speaker for today, but she is one of the Haligi or the pillars of Philippine medicine. No? And she has served a lot of positions, and uh, the latest, of course, is being our Secretary of Health in 2010, Doctora. May kilang po ang haba ng credentials ni Doctora. I Google nyo na lang si Doctora. Of course, our next uh, panelist is our dear president, the healthy and the pogi. The no supplement needed sa kanya. <laughs> Dr. Patrick Gerald Moral is the current president of the Philippine College of Chess Physicians. She, he is also the department head of the Department of Bioethics, Faculty of Medicine and Surgery. I know most of you are his uh, students. And of course, also the training officer for the Center for Respiratory Medicine, University of Santo Tomas. And our last, but not the least speaker, of course, is Dr. Lilibet Antonio Garcia. She graduated from FEU Batch 88, Bata pa, okay? And a practicing general physician or family physician to, known to most of us. At present, she is connected with the naturopathic treatment. So may I ask the three panelists to occupy the... Doctora, we want to hear it again, although you've uh, mentioned it well during your lecture. Is it acceptable for physicians to prescribe products with no approved therapeutic value? Ah, unahin natin yung, ano, yung healthy. <laughs> so we'll ask first Dr. Moral for the morality of the question. And of course, uh, followed by Dr. Lilibet Garcia, and uh, Dr. I will have the final say. Okay, thank you. Okay, just as a disclaimer, I am not on food supplements, even though I, it looks like I have had a lot of supplements in my life. Uh, but uh, I hope that I will be able to uh, give some justice here in terms of what uh, the ethics behind food supplement use is, uh, or the prescription rather. I think uh, Dr. Cabral has mentioned everything very succinctly and clearly in terms of what they cover. Um, let me see. I did uh, some presentation, hopefully, to help us out. Uh, remember that our profession is basically based on trust. It's been mentioned by Dr. Cabral that most of these food supplements, most of these food supplements are not uh, proven to be of benefit. Most, we're saying, some have uh, therapeutic value, but most have not been proven. So the physician is always placed on a position of trust. I just want to show you some guidelines in terms of uh, prescription. But I think the challenge will be that we have physicians who do prescribe health food supplements. And I think the other challenge is that we also have physicians who don't only prescribe, but they also sell in their clinics. And I think that would be the challenge. So as we said, we're in a position of trust. But when you talk about a position of trust, it has to be reversed and there has to be truth in it. So if there's no truth, then that becomes the problem. So we, we want to show you something. Now, this is not related to our lecture for today, our discussion, but this is a study. It's, it's just released just recently in 2015. It's called Taylor, Targeting Attire to Improve Likelihood of Rapport Investigators. What do you see here? You see all those blue marks? That means this is the relation of trust to what a doctor wears. If you wear a white coat with formal attire, that means you have a tie, a long sleeves, your trust rating is much greater. So for the Middle East and Canada, you can see that for, for both of them, 
That's highly rated. For Asians, as long as you have a white coat, not otherwise specified, you're trusted. That's why to have a food supplement in your clinic alone, even just to have a standee or have something in your clinic, invest trust in it already. Even if you don't say, I am endorsing this drug, it automatically implies effectivity. So the doctor has to be responsible for it. So I will not focus on the other aspects, but just basic ethical principles to look at. When you talk about autonomy, for the patient to be able to decide whether he wants to use a food supplement or not, there has to be adequate information, and that's part of it. So we have to respect the patient's autonomy. For beneficence, if ever we do decide to prescribe something or give a health supplement, it must always be directed at beneficence, but making sure to balance it with no harm that can come to the patient. But again, beneficence should be based on available information or data. Now, justice says we don't give something to the patient where the, which the patient does not need because you are having the patient spend for things and well, he can otherwise spend this on medications which will actually address his specific ailment. So we don't have any guidelines for the local setting, but these are other principles that we would take a look at. We've talked about informed consent, but there's also the principle of cooperation. What does that mean? It means if it's an evil act, even if you don't do the evil act yourself, but are participant to it, then it becomes a problem. So this is where you have to be careful about conflicts of interest. You know that some prescription of health supplements are related to multi-level marketing. Therefore, the prescription is not really based on patient benefit, but more on physician benefit. And that will be an issue that we have to consider in terms of what we disclose to patients. So what would be the ethics? I try to get instead what would be related to the sale of health-related. We're saying health-related, even if it's claimed that they have no health benefits, what will be the ethics of it? So if you choose to prescribe it or even carry it in your clinic, um, you have to be careful that whatever you carry in your clinic must have claims of scientific validity. Remember, one patient who says, I got better from what you gave does not constitute scientific validity. One patient may have gotten better, but the 99 may have died, and that's a difference. And that's the problem of relying on testimonials. I got better. Nakalakad ako after ininom to. Sumayang asawa ko pagkatapos kong inumin to. So these are things that we have to consider. They do not constitute evidence. Now, there's a risk always of exploiting the patients in the clinic, and per se, the sale of things that are not of proven benefit may actually demean the profession and the position of medicine in itself. So we should limit the sales of products that serve the immediate needs and pressing needs of their patients. You know, there's always a conflict here. Can we sell things in our clinic? Because there's a pharmacy law that says we cannot for drugs. But there are, it's even in the USA, understand in certain circumstances, no? I live in an island, and the closest place where they can get the product is seven mountains away then it is all right because it gives a favor to the benefit of your patient. But in these cases where benefit is unproven, then it may be unethical to uh, provide these things. But if you do decide them, they say you can provide them free at, of charge or at cost. But it's, this is also tricky because this may be introducing something to the patient and on follow-up, they will now have to buy the product. So this is, these are things that have to be remembered. Even if they're given free or at cost, there is a risk. Because as been mentioned earlier, there are also concomitant risks with the use of these uh, medications, uh, not medications, but these food supplements or health, supposed health supplements. So it helps ensure the removal of elements sometimes of personal gain. That means if we do anything, we try to make sure that there's no element of personal gain or any financial conflicts that may come because this will always interfere with a physician's judgment if there is potential gain on his part. Now, if you do have arrangements, like it's a multi-level marketing, therefore, that has to be disclosed. No? That is a part, because I will have patients who have come to me to say, this other doctor has prescribed them this product. And they will ask, is this, a medic is this actually a true medication? And that's always difficult to answer in between, right? You, have to want, you want to preserve your relationship with the other doctors, but at the same time, you have the ultimate goal of preserving your patient's safety. 
And that's one of the things that can be done. So if you do carry anything in your clinic, you must disclose your financial arrangements with them because this will make the patient aware of possible conflicts of interest in this setup. And if you notice in the US, this is what is put here. There are certain clinics that will say we're the only ones who carry certain products. So physicians should not participate in exclusive distributors of health-related products uh, that are available only through the office. Now let me add my comment with virtues are always important. I think to be a good doctor, it's not simply, well, knowledge is very important. <laughs> you cannot be just be virtuous no? and have no knowledge at all. Then of course, it has to be supplemented though. That means you have to have integrity. That means you make sure that your job, your, your being a physician is not simply an occupation. It is a profession. And that's all, it's not only a profession, it's also a vocation. So it's a mixture of three things. So there has to be honesty that has to be given to the patients. So if they ask you regarding a drug or a, a specific health supplement, and you know it's not useful, give them that information. If you know nothing about it, read up on it, and then go it back to them to tell them the information. Of course, we don't invent that it's not useful if we do not really know anything about it. But it is incumbent upon us to inform ourselves. Now, altruism means going beyond what is expected of you to do something for the benefit of an individual. And that's an example by looking at what can benefit your patient when we talk about this. Prudence means it's not being timid. It means before you do anything, it has to be backed up by thought and evidence. And I think that's been emphasized very clearly earlier. And the last, I think, why I had emphasized is fortitude. Fortitude means even if everyone else is prescribing things, that they say, oh, this is useful, but you see no evidence to its benefit. You can have the fortitude to uh, refuse prescribing. In fact, that, that, the, the term prescribing the health supplement seems to be an oxymoron in itself because when you say prescribe, it refers to a drug that is useful. This means probably we should not, as physicians, recommend uh, based on the principles that we've mentioned in terms of ethics. So with that, thank you very much for listening. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Rebeth by profession, FEU Batch 88. And I know Ms. Uh, Memorial through RMC, Rizal Medical Center. I had my pre-residency at ano, RMC. Okay? So for me, uh, actually I'm not, I don't want to quarrel with anyone, okay? Because this is my opinion. And my opinion is what I believe in, okay? So, I'm so big before, 160 pounds, okay? I had a problem with my, because I, being a doctor, I really don't take vitamins because I, I think I'm, I'm healthy because I'm so big, I'm fat, no? I'm fat, I don't get sick, except that I'm really obese, okay? So at the start, at 40, I just only took the, my uh, supplement, supplementation of synthetic, when I got pregnant with my daughter. First time, calcium lactate and iron, okay? That's the first time that I took my medicine, food supplement. Okay, it's not food supply, vitamins, okay? The synthetic one. The thing that happened is, uh, do we know that vitamin C can uh, make us sick with kidney stone? Do you know that? We can read it in the uh, memes, diba? So I took vitamin C. Because I usually, I often got colds when taking care of kids. Because every month with colds, I cannot get rid of that colds unless I took antibiotics. Every month. And I don't want that to happen. And then, I took vitamin C, but my, I had my gastritis three days after taking the medicine. Three days only. And then after that, I treat with uh, cimetidine, so it became okay. I repeat again, 
Same dose, only once a day. And then gastritis came again. Diba? So, what will I do? And then, I change my vitamins into calcium lactate na lang. Since I'm 47 years old, menopausal, to protect my bones. Diba? What happened is, I had my UTI. UTI for two weeks, three kinds of um, medica medication, no? but it didn't work. So what I did was to get a laboratory. No? I had my ultrasound, kidney ultrasound, KUB. And my kidney is uh, suffering from hydronephrosis with multiple multiple lithiasis, okay? CT stono was done, same thing. So that's my problem. I am nervous because I might uh, have my dialysis someday, diba? Because of the destruction of the cells of my kidney. Then, I use also the synthetic ones because that's the one that I know. Akalka, no, Rowatinix, and it works. HNBB, it works. The, the stone was gone. Then after that, I treat my uh, infection also with antibiotics, three kinds of antibiotics. After the treatment, I tested my liver because I'm, I'm nervous with my kidney and the liver. Of course, my SGPT, the SGPT normally is 30 in that laboratory. And mine is 90. No? So that's triple of normal na, di ba? Then I treat again the, for the liver. No? I took the Essentiale Forte. No, but it didn't work. Why? That's my favorite, ano eh, for liver problem. So, it didn't work for me. After eating, I finished it one month, then I took, we eat uh, lechon and papaitan in Pangasinan. Because my husband is from Pangasinan. So, lechon and papaitan, normally SGPT is 30. Mine is 90. And I'm taking medicine already, the vitamins, synthetic one. After that, I did the laboratory again after eating lechon and papaitan. My SGPT went up and shoot up into 213. So I don't know where to go now. 213, it's seven times the normal. I don't know what is the normal value here of your SGPT. So very timely, my patient, my patient is the one who come to me and share to me this product of no approved therapeutic effect. Okay? Oh, it's, it has no approved therapeutic effect. And he just only did the demo. If you have time, I can show you. He did only the demo. And I saw that he put the oil, no? Put the oil. The oil represents the lechon and papaitan. Do you agree that they are all fatty foods? Diba? They're all fatty. And I saw that the supplement catch up the oil and put it down. It means it will go to pupuna. So, my thinking is, Okay, I will want I want to try. Just try it. Try the product first. So I what I did was to try. I don't have the PowerPoint with me because you know, I don't know how to ano eh, to do that. So my SGPT before was 213. After one month alone, only one tablet a day because my mind is, I'm still confused. Is it, it, will it work or not? Because we doctors, uh, we studied about the 
synthetic ones. We didn't study the organic ones. Okay? So, I took only one tablet a day with that vitamins, and the name is lecithin E. Okay? So, before, it's just only one tablet daily. So, I used it for one month, and then after a month, my SGPT went down half, 213 to 118. I told them, I'm a doctor. I don't want to prescribe those if I don't have the laboratory. Okay? If I have the laboratory, then I will. Then after one month, 118. After one month, again, 42 na lang. After one month, 24 na lang. Di ba? I know, uh, I cannot get everything in your mind, di ba? But for me, this is my best. I studied this for three months and two doctors, both of us, doctors. The other doctor has uh, diabetes, SGPT, cholesterol, and high blood. I just only took this one. And everything normal after two months. Okay? So, I continue to use it. And what happened was, my weight, 160 pounds, I lose weight 5 pounds in 10 days. I took a lot of Senecal and Fitrum. But I'm afraid of my liver. No? Because everything that we eat will go to the liver first. Diba? And I really don't know what will happen since that, that's my first time. I had one patient, okay? I cannot do the study because I only have uh, a few with same kind of illnesses, not like in the hospital. In one in hospital, you can concentrate patients with kidney diseases, with heart problem, diba? In internal medicine, in neurology, eh, nephrology, diba? I had one patient, 11 years old. He's a, he's a patient from NKTI, kidney. The problem is, um, uh, what do you call this? A lot of protein in the urine. What do you call that? No, not albuminuria, the disease itself. Yeah, nephrotic syndrome. <laughs> nephrotic syndrome. The patient didn't come to me for the nephrotic. The problem is he had a lot of furunculosis in his head. I, I told the father, your child is suffering from another disease because the face is a moon fussy. So I asked the father, what is he taking? He's taking steroid, Medrol 16, for one year. No? So on nephrotic syndrome, the doctor is giving medrol for one year. And then I told the father, I would like to give him the vitamins, okay? So I just do the demo first, and the father said, okay. Because maybe the immune system of that child is very low due to the steroid, okay? 11 years old. And the doctors only treat the, the, that boy for the proteinuria only, ano, medrol. He used only medrol for the proteinuria. And go to uh, kidney center every week. Every week. But after one week of using the supplement, the berries and the acerola C, the proteinuria was negative in one week time. So I really don't know what happened. All I know is the food supplement works for him. And what did the doctor do? He tapered down the medrol. And then the boy went to the province na. 
Because the boy was advised by the doctor, if we cannot treat that proteinuria, you will undergo dialysis. No? But the boy went home to uh, Iloilo with the mother because the parents are separated. I don't want to overclaim this product, but it works for my patient. And I don't, uh, because I want them to be a member so that they will not tell me that I'm gaining money from them. Because our membership is free. I just only want them to use to try if it's okay for them then okay if not okay then you can return no 90 days satisfaction guarantee but in another experience if we don't have money no uh, one patient came from the big hospital undergone angio angiogram no and the doctor said, oh, you have to prepare at least 500,000 so that you can, we can do the bypass surgery. Okay? Siyempre, biyak dito, biyak dyan sa legs. 500,000 because it's different from the angioplasty. It's much higher cost, di ba? When I saw, actually, I didn't go for the father. I approached the daughter because the daughter is... Uh, big but he said my problem is my father he will undergo uh, bypass surgery but we don't have the money yet okay can you come with me first since I know that the vitamins is for removal of fats no for blood thinner no and for uh, muscle protection so I offer them three kinds of supplements only. But I did not give them the normal, normal way of intake because he's already suffering from heart problem, right? He had difficulty of breathing. So that's why he go to the hospital. I only offer them three kinds of vitamins. And after that, he go back to the hospital again. And the doctor said, oh, we're not going to operate you because all your laboratory was normal. So that's my uh, experience through this. Um, anyway, if you believe, that's your, ano na, it's in your own. But for me, I'm a doctor. I will not let my license no? claiming something that I, it didn't work. Because my patience is near my place. So that's why I can usually follow them up. Because doctors here in UST, patients came from another province. Diba? Do you often Do you often follow up your patients? You often call your patients for follow-up. Do you call them and ask them, how do you feel? Do you know that your patients died already? Huh? Diba? We don't know. If they die, sometimes we just only give vitamins. And we just only give medicine. But if they die, they suffer outside. We don't know what happened to them, diba? But for me as a doctor, I use this supplement because I'm afraid of my health. Diba? If I'm a doctor and I have uh, two kids, no? My doctor, being a doctor, I cannot pass it down to my two kids unless they will study medicine. Okay? So what I did was to take this because I have a uh, experience with the synthetic now and I'm also taking care of my 82 year old mom diabetic and she's still okay no kidney problem do you realize that those patients were suffering from diabetes why is it that 
someday, somehow, they will suffer from kidney problem. According to Dr. Cabral said, um, medicines for pain reliever, you will also sometimes get your kidney problem, di ba? And also liver problem. So that's what I'm thinking. I don't want to get old sick. No? I want to be healthy. If my eyes are already with sick, no? I cannot see anything. I cannot practice my doctor. If my mind goes out, I cannot be a doctor to anyone. No? So I think um, we have to take care of ourselves. No? Okay? So I think my sharing is already too long. <laughs> so thank you very much. And any questions? Maybe later now, okay? Thank you, Paul. I would like to summarize what Dr. Moral uh, talked about. And uh, he told us about the ethical issues uh, involving the prescribing of uh, health-related products. He actually even opened up by telling us that our profession is based on trust. And he ended his talk by uh, telling us the different physician virtues. Of course, Dr. Garcia uh, opened up by describing herself and uh, the diseases that she has had and the uh, uh, improvement that she experienced with the intake of lecithin. And she also elucidated by uh, giving us different uh, uh, cases uh, of the patients that she has seen in her clinic and the um, importance of personally following up your patient, even calling them up for follow-up. So, any questions for our three panelists? Dr. Mansukhani. Well, after hearing after hearing the talks this morning and uh, and the, the panelists who have, have spoken already this afternoon, what seems to amaze me are belief systems, you know. And uh, if you believe you are right, you think you're right, you know. And there's nobody that's going to correct that for you. That depends on a lot of other things, like your ex personal experience, say for example, your cultural your cultural you know, inputs from the past, how you were brought up, even your parents and everything else modifies your belief systems. So it'd be very hard to, the hardest thing to actually change our beliefs, right? Once you have that belief and you stick to that, that's it. You know? So um, at one, at, uh, from, a, you know, from, a, from a standpoint, I can say that we are all right, right? All of us are right based on our beliefs. But from an ethical standpoint or from a, st that's this I think is a question more for Patrick. <laughs> from an ethical standpoint, um, or from a societal standpoint, maybe also Dr. Cabral wants to answer that, uh, how do you address uh, the question of beliefs in terms of, uh, say for example, endpoints? Nobody wants to die. And there's this belief that I don't want to die early, say for example, because otherwise I will not be able to practice my profession. Or quality of life, which is being harped at as well as one of the solid endpoints, which Tony Dance also pointed out, you know? And so maybe you'd like to comment on that, the belief systems, because I think that would be important in the formation of our medical students as well. Well, if you're going to have belief systems, there are going to be difficulties, really. I mean, the cultural aspects are things that uh, create contextual features when we treat patients. Now, however, we have to start first on, are we totally throwing out health supplements? I don't think so. It's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, we just want to come up with evidence, more evidence, to see whether it does work. Now, are you free to use certain drugs? Even We use drugs sometimes off-label. That means these are not approved indications, but we do use them off-label. But these have usually come about with certain reports of utility. Now, however, it, it's remember, we have to balance it. It's always easy to say, as I said, testimonials will show that it may have worked on a few patients, but again, we have to look at the general picture. That means if I've seen it does work, at least it wor with one patient, it seemed to have worked with this patient. It's incumbent upon me to research on it, to look up what's the available data, because you have to look at both arms. Not only what appeared to have been of benefit, but what is the potential long harm also. 
I think that's why terms like complementary medicine have been emphasized. That means it is something that complements existing medicine. But to say that something will totally replace it, I probably will err on the side of going where the evidence lies because my goal is always patient safety. Uh, if I may compromise my patient in any way, I think that's where the risk will be. If there's anything I agreed with in terms of the points of doctora, it's in terms of following up your patients. You'd like to know what happened to them regardless of whether you gave them health supplements or actual medications because that is true vest vested interest in the sense you're invested in the patient rather than invested in something else. Thank you. Um, I have the same opinion. I think that our profession is based on science and more and more we are trying to base our decisions and actions on science. So it is not acceptable for us to say that just because it worked for me, it is going to work for you. And just because it worked for me and the other medicine did not this time, it is going to be the same thing later on. We have been taught that there are many fallacies that we can uh, enter into by this kind of thinking. And that's the reason why we have the scientific method of investigating things in order to find out if something is true or not, and if something can be relied upon or not. And uh, one of the highlights and one of the key aspects of our science is reproducibility. So we do need to make studies of claims like this. And until those studies actually prove by the scientific method that these are the things that it does or doesn't do, then it will remain in the realm of no therapeutic claims approved because our science says you have to prove what you are claiming. And you cannot prove it by just one or two persons telling us that this is what happened to me, it works, there. I got better, therefore it is due to the medicine that I took. Well, I brushed my teeth this morning and then I got run over by a truck. Is it uh, because I brushed my teeth this morning that I got run over by a truck? That is not really what it is. The other thing is, uh, um, in the mention of lecithin, we all know that lecithin is a surfactant. And when you put lecithin in oil, the oil will disperse. It doesn't mean to say that that is what it will do in the body. So it is not right to demonstrate this and say, this is what it will do to my body, because it's not necessarily so. OK, other questions? Children, <laughs> do not sleep. <laughs> We have uh, three uh, good speakers. Yeah, Dr. Mateo, please. Can you use the other mic? Thank you for the three speakers. No? These are quite uh, insightful um, statements and, and knowledge gained. But I just want to add a few more. Aside from practice of medicine being governed by science, there's also the regulatory side. No? And, regulation would entail us to be scientific, to have evidence-based um, facts or basis. No? So, um, and of course, I would like to say, to stress to that accountability for the safety of our patient and accountability that if you go outside regulation or outside the dictates of science, of evidence-based medicine, then you have to be ready to be accountable in case something harmful or disadvantageous happen to our patient. So, yeah. Thank you. Dr. Aimi, Dr. Villaspi, you might have something in your mind. Nothing in your mind. <laughs> Dr. Balgos, I'm calling the officers, the past and the present of PCCP. <laughs> so as what we have heard this morning about the talk of Dr. Tony Dance, anything that we have experienced, research, 
uh, should have to be really written and published for it to be construed as true or something that is really uh, studied extensively. So uh, if there are no other questions, I would like to uh, end this session and thank our three panelists.